Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath afternoon. For those that still Sabbath time. And um, we're going to continue this study from last night, from reading through Jones's uh, eighth presentation from 1893 uh, General Conference. So we're going to begin by opening with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all of, the, all of your blessings, grateful for the Sabbath, for the fellowship, and for the things that you teach us to correct us, to instruct us in righteousness. And we are thankful, Lord, for the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. We know that uh, we are in darkness and we need your light and we need your strength to respond uh, to the light that you have given us. We ask that you can be with us now as we read, continue to read from the messages given long ago that parallel our time. And we pray, Lord, that we can make applications in our own lives in these things that we are reading. We pray for this movement. We know that there's division and has been for a long time. And we know, Lord, that you are seeking to bring us together. And so we ask that you can do it through the work of your Holy Spirit and our desire to follow and serve you. Please strengthen us and keep us. Be with us now, we pray, and with each person. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, this study from last night, we're just going to pick up right where we left off. And basically, we had left off with this statement saying, all your little differences, which arouse the combative spirit among brethren, are devices of Satan to divert minds from the great and fearful issue before us. So these little differences um, on White's talking about are, are what? What are little differences? How, how do we define a little difference? So we have little differences. So what's 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 the context? I mean, if somebody um, believes differently about us on some interpret interpretation of a Bible verse, is that a little difference, or is it maybe even something? Would we include how somebody understands the Godhead as a little difference? Where do we draw the line between big differences and little differences? Um, but she says, all your little differences which arouse the combative spirit among brethren are devices of Satan to divert minds from the great and fearful issue before us. So part of the problem would be that sometimes we think things are not little differences. Now, these would mostly be, I think, personal differences, though, that she's referring to. Would they not? Could be right. Yeah. And because when I think of little differences, I mean, you know, we have different tastes in music. We have different um, ways we live our life. You know, some people are extroverted. Some people are introverted you know, different ways in which we communicate. Um, and we can often be really critical of these things that we imagine we see in other people, which are usually only a reflection of something wrong in ourselves that we don't like. So somebody steps upon our toes um, or we find them annoying or something like that. But they can be theological issues as well. Um, debating over an interpretation of a verse um, sometimes people have pet theories about something. Somebody disagrees with them. Uh, they take that personally. Now, and even sometimes on bigger issues, um, we can be offended when somebody uh, doesn't like us, doesn't like what we say. Um, and, and sometimes we can be offended when somebody uh, shows us that we're wrong about something. So even though the other person is right, 
Um, we don't like to be corrected. So all these types of things uh, can arouse the combative spirit. So there's been lots of things, you know, through the years as a Seventh-day Adventist that I've personally been in, involved in where I have had a combative spirit and, and other people have had a combative spirit. And I've, and I've watched, you know, like either with me or I've seen between brethren. You know, you can sometimes see, you know, two brothers going at it. Um, they have both have a chip on their shoulder and they're both in the wrong. So, so these things that cause these, that arouse this combative spirit among brethren, these are devices of Satan to divert minds from the great and fearful issue before us. So we know that um, Satan is the one behind this. And so we should always be aware of that. When we have issues with our brother or our brother has issues with us, we have to try to figure out why that is. Is this just Satan? And lots of times we can justify in our own minds that this person is such a problem and that, you know, they need to be gone. Or we need to deal with them in some way. And we're actually doing the work of Satan. So Joan says, shall we allow Satan to cheat us? Brethren, you know that in the things of this world, it is bad to be cheated. But when a man cheats you in the meanest little infinitesimal way, you feel worse about it than if he had done it in any other way, don't you? Now, I'm not sure particularly what Jones means by that. So, um, but the, the audience seems to understand it. Maybe somebody could explain it to me. Now, Satan stirs up. What, what's that, Jeff? What's the word? What's the word? Infinitesimal. Infinitesimal is just re really, really tiny. It's like infinitely small. And and the word mean the word meanest there also means insignificant. It doesn't mean uh, mean in the sense of like somebody's being mean to you. It means the smallest little infinitely small way so these little slights is what he's saying these can feel we can feel worse about it than if he had done it in some other way now i don't know if that's personally how i would feel about it i can easily take little slights um i can probably take big slights for the most part too but um these little differences and sometimes they are very little differences and we talked about that where you have, you know, people who you're 99.9% .9 in with agreement on all kinds of things. There are people in this movement. Uh, you can have more problems with, with them than somebody who only agrees with maybe 50% of what you believe. You can be much more lenient towards people who um, believe radically different even from you than somebody who who you're brethren with and, and in some little point differs and churches are born with these little types of differences. So Satan stirs up these little differences that have not a particle of merit or principle in them if they were carried out to their extreme. And yet he will get our eyes on these things and make a great commotion in the church. And by that, turn our minds off from these fearful issues that are hanging over our heads. Now, it is bad enough to be cheated at all, but when we allow ourselves to be cheated in such a mean little insignificant way as that, it is worse than let us quit. Now, an example of this for me in this movement, the one thing I've seen, and this is just my observation, but the movement would be moving towards understanding something, whatever it was. And we would end up getting sidetracked especially since 2014, but with these different schisms that were occurring, different groups leaving, different people being upset. Um, you know, one that I was personally involved in had to do with Tanya. So with Tanya Beeman, she, she took offense to the whole idea uh, that the 430 years began with the weaning of Isaac when he was five years old, that, uh, she didn't believe that Isaac could have been weaned at that age. And it became a real heated issue for, for you time. Mean, you mean 400 years? Yeah, 400 years. Yeah, I knew I was saying something wrong, but the 400 years, yes. 
So the 400 years of affliction, she didn't want to start when Isaac was five. She wanted to start when Isaac was like two or three, right? So, um, so, so this, this was a heated issue. And then when I was there in uh, 2017, we actually had a meeting about it. Bronwyn and had come back from uh, the Italian camp meeting. And um, so we, Jeff hadn't come back. Jeff wasn't around at the time. And Bronwyn had set up this meeting. Uh, Parminder was there too. He had come back. And it wasn't the Italian camp meeting. It was the, um, the Romanian camp meeting. Because that's where they had the camp meeting for organization. Right, right, Stephen? September of 2017. That's correct. Yeah. So it must have been there. It seems like a long, long time ago. But um, so Tanya, anyway, she was really hot under the collar about this whole issue. And, and of course, she was being opposed in a way that wasn't, wasn't kind. Um, Tabo had re written some things to her, very dismissive emails. Um, and I was trying as much as I could to be conciliatory with Tanya. But she was in such a, uh, a state of mind with this meeting. And Bronwyn wasn't helping, and neither was Parminder. Um, in trying to just recognize, because I was trying to see the things that she was pointing out that we needed to look at. And, um, but they were just basically opposed to her as a person. And now I still think that if somebody's opposed to you, you don't need to take it personally. I mean, Tanya was at fault in the sense that she was, she was offended, which, you know, you shouldn't be offended just because somebody treats you badly. You shouldn't take it personally. But she was being treated badly, so those people also were responsible. And there didn't seem to be anything I could do to try to be, to be conciliate. My conciliation didn't seem to help the situation at all. Um, so, but we can see those types of things happen. They create a great commotion. And, and just sometimes when you disagree about something, even something like uh, the 400 years, well, just leave it alone. If it's an issue that's controverted, just give it time. Right. And I think this is partly what was even happening um, in connection with the daily and other issues. Ellen White was saying, basically, don't discuss these issues, not because they're, you know, one group is white, right and one group is wrong. And, and you know, she's not choosing who's right and who's wrong but you're not going to solve the problems this way and that we need to be able to sit down as brethren and study together that was the issue part of the issue with the daily which people of course take her statements and twist them around as if you know uh, the new view of the daily uh, can be promoted but the old view can't I mean because she was quite clear that it, the issue was don't press this new view of the daily issue and also with those that were trying to support the old view don't make this an issue as well. You know, there's other work that needs to be done. So, you know, we, we can we can see here um, that that principle is involved even in things that sometimes are truth. So not even just little differences intellectually, but I think it's the little differences are really not so much the issue that's being discussed. It's it's our hurt feelings around an issue. That's the problem. So uh, he goes on and quotes Ellen White, the true peace will come among God's people when they, when, when through united zeal and earnest prayer, uh, the false peace that exists to a large degree is disturbed. So in order to get rid of this false peace she talks about, so what's a false peace? Because there's a true peace and there's a false peace. What is a false peace? I would say that, uh, you know, when you're just being there 
and not arguing or anything, but you're not happy about it. Okay, yeah. So it's something that's put on, right? And and, and I think that is, in some ways, that's a dangerous uh, because it's it's a pretense, right? Um, people who are nice to your face in one way, but behind your back, um, they're not nice to you, right? So so we know that there is a false peace, and she says that exists to a large degree. So there's a false peace that exists to a large degree. People are together in a church but they're not in unity. So we need a true peace because we need a united zeal. And it's through united zeal and earnest prayer that this false peace is disturbed. And we need to have that false peace disturbed because we need to know the condition that we're in. We need to be disturbed. Those who are under the influence of the spirit of God will not be fanatical, but calm, steadfast, free from extravagance. Now, we, we understand calm and steadfast. What does she mean, free from extravagance? What is extravagance? Why, why she's using that? Because we usually think of it as just like fancy dress and, and all that. Drama. Okay, sort of drama. Um. So if we look up, because, you know, it's always good to look up the 1828 Webster's Dictionary definition of extra of words. So if we look up extravagance, um, so it, it means literally a wandering beyond a limit, an excursion or sally from the usual course or limit. Um, in writing a discourse going beyond the limits of strict truth or probability as exact extravagance of expression or description. Uh, excessive affection is another definition, passion or appetite. Uh, excess of expenditures of, proper, expenditures of property, that's where we usually think of extravagance. Um, but in general, any excess or wandering from prescribed limits, irregularity, wildness, in the extravagance of imagination. Now, so here, I, I would think to a large degree, uh, this is um, related to the, the idea of fanaticism, overstating things, uh, just becoming excited about things, worked up. So if we... If we take this in this calm, in dealing with the word calm, right? So we have, um, they need to not be fanatical, but calm, steadfast, free from extravagance. Um, you know, we can see how we can get caught up in what's happening in the world and become fanatical. We're not calm, we're emotional, right? We're not steadfast. That is, we, we move from one idea to the next. We're not solid. We're not, we don't have that sort of uh, patience or perseverance. Um, you know, our emotions can go up and down. Uh, we can think one thing one day and one thing another day. Unstable, right? And then free from extra extravagance. That is, these flights of imagination or worry or concern. Right. So those who are under the influence of the spirit of God will not exhibit these characteristics. But let all who have had the light of truth shining clear and distinct upon their pathway. Be careful how they cry. Peace and safety. So these people who have had the light of truth. Why do they cry peace and safety? So, so she's giving a balanced um, counsel here, is she not? Is that what we see here? 
Be careful how you make the first move to suppress the messages of truth. Be careful what influence you exert at this time. So we know that we are in the last days. There's lots of things happening. And, and we, we can't be fanatical. We need to be calm, steadfast, free from extravagance. But we've had the light of truth, and we can't be crying peace and safety, can we? And, and some people are going to be suppressing the messages of truth. So we need to be careful. What is she talking about? What, what's the problem? Why are these different? Because we can look at these differences that exist, right? So we have a false peace, and there's a true peace. We have uh, fanaticism, but we also have, on the other hand, people who are not getting caught up in that fanaticism per se, but have another error on their side. They're going to cry peace and safety. Are these not extremes that exist? I would say in one form or another. No. See, so when we look at these, these situations that have arisen in this movement, um, and even the one that exists presently, we have to be extremely careful, right? So when Colin presents his study on, on the presidents of the United States, showing that Trump's going to be president again, it can be very easy for some people to just dismiss it and, and, and not listen to it because he's going in this direction that we don't like, right? So, and, and some people may not like Odilia's presentations. They may not like the chronology being used, whatever it is. But we have to be very, very careful that we're not suppressing truth when we oppose something that we don't agree with. We need to be, we need to follow the spirit of Christ. We need to follow the counsel that's been given to us. So when it came to what Colin and Odilio were presenting, we didn't just strongly oppose it. Correct? Well, I, in, in my you case, might... I, I didn't do that. I mean, I didn't strongly oppose. In fact, I, I didn't really understand where he was off until I, I spent many, many hours uh, going over his presentation. Yeah. But also, there's many things that he was shown, I believe, that this actually came from God. Same with Odili, right? So you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is what <laughs> Satan tries to get us to do. Right? Well, that's what's been going on in the in this movement for a long time is, you know, we'd, we'd come upon stuff and then um, that guy would be out and then you'd want to throw all the stuff that, that he developed out when, you know, maybe two thirds of it was good and the other third maybe not. Yeah. Because um, yeah, even when it came to Parminder's and Tess's messages, I was very disappointed when they took them down. Uh, one is you need this record. I mean, imagine if the Adventist Church uh, just destroyed all of the documents of all the different offshoots and stuff that have come out of the church, you know, destroyed. Uh, we wouldn't have the information we have today, and we wouldn't have the understanding that we, we, we do have today if they would have done that. Right. And then also, of course, from a study, a line point of view, you know, not having the dates that certain presentations or presented would, would make it much more difficult. But also, there were things that Satan mixes truth with error. And that's, that's often right. to make, make you know, the two things as we've talked about. One is it makes error more palatable because it has truth mixed with it. But often the truth that is mixed with it 
is something that is actually needful. And Satan wants us when we recognize the error to throw out the truth with it as well. So to me, it's extremely important when you're studying something that you disagree with, that you don't just dismiss everything that's being said. You need to thoroughly understand where you stand, where it is diverged from the truth. And you also should be looking at ways to, to help those who believe those errors, right? So that they can understand where those mistakes lie. Because if you just get rid of the person who's presenting the idea and you shut them down, well, many people will then uh, see the injustice of it, the unfairness of it, and, and then side with that person in their errors. So, you know, for instance, if the, if the 2520 was error, for instance, the church definitely went about it the wrong way. Because if they had been patient, spent time studying with people, following the counsels in the spirit of prophecy, if it was error, they would have been shown how it's error, right? But if it's truth, they would also be able to be corrected. And so we as individuals need to be able to do that. So a party spirit is this satanic spirit that's, that's dealing with hurt feelings and all these types of things. The reason why many people take the positions they do have nothing to do with the intellect, but have a lot to do with their emotions, of who they yeah. saw, who they sympathize with. And, and so that is where we need to be very careful in how we deal uh, with people that we differ. So I'm going to go on and read here. Um, Those who profess to believe the special truths for this time need to be converted and sanctified by the truth. As Christians, we are made depositaries of sacred truth. And, um, um, and we are not to keep the truth in the outer court, but bring it into the sanctuary of the soul. Then the church will possess divine vitality throughout. The weak shall be as David and David as the angel of the Lord. Then let us confess our weakness, this is Jones, and find out as quickly as possible that we are weak. The weak shall be as David, and their weakness is united in Christ's strengths. Um, and then Ellen White says, one question will be all absorbing. Who shall approach the nearest to the likeness of Christ? That is the one thing, Jones says. Not who shall be the greatest in the conference, or who shall be the greatest in the church, or who shall have this or that position in the church or the conference committee. That is not it, but who shall approach the nearest to the likeness of Christ. Ellen White says, who shall do most to win souls to righteousness? When this is the ambition of believers, contention is at an end. The prayer of Christ is answered. So we should seek to be Christ-like to win souls, especially those that we differ with, that we think are in danger. If we really cared about them, we would labor for them. John says, brethren, that is where we are. And we can agree that this is where we are as well, right? Yes. Right. We can see the situation, we know where we are at, and we know what we have to do. Ellen White goes on, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the whole multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. The Spirit of Christ made them one. This is the fruit of abiding in Christ. But if dissension, envy, jealousy, and strife are fruit we bear, it is not possible that we are abiding in Christ. Now, when we think about the Spirit of Christ... I mean, we usually think of it much more in the abstract, right? We think of it as the Holy Spirit. We need God's Spirit to come into our lives, right? It's it's sort of, it, it becomes a little bit, um, 
just sort of a phrase that we use. But there is a very practical and real way in which we can know whether we have the spirit of Christ or not. And that is how we act. Because if we have the spirit of Christ, we act like Christ. Those that claim to have the spirit but are envious, jealous, um, dissentious, right? Those people do not have, we do not have Christ abiding in us, right? Because those are the fruits of which spirit? Yeah, the other guy. Yeah. So the spirit of Christ, you know, love, joy, mercy, patience, long suffering, you know, mercy, all these different types of things, you know, not easily offended. All of these characteristics that are, are characteristics of Christ, we don't usually have that in when, when we measure ourselves and we measure others. We measure people on all different kinds of, of standards that we have set up. You know, if somebody agrees with us, if somebody hurts us in some way, well, then that's the problem of that person. We think that that person has a problem, right? Not realizing, you know, a simple thing. If somebody offends you, where does the problem lie? It rely, it, 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 it's, it's you it, or huh. it's me. If it offends me, then it's 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 an offense to me. So it must be me. Right. It, it, you have to examine what it was that they actually did. If you if you feel that 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 emotion rise in you in a situation, well, you don't blame the other person. You take a step back and look at yourself and say, what is it about me that's reacting to this person in this way? Um, I probably told this story before, but I remember there was a brother was teaching Sabbath school one time in Warburg, and uh, there was a lady in the class who was very upset with this brother. She had some kind of personal problem with him, and and everything that he was saying, she was opposing. Didn't matter what it was, and uh, so after church, I I kindly spoke to her and I said, you know, I find that when I'm having a problem with somebody. It says more about me than about the other person. And, of course, she swore at me and ran off, walked off. Um, so it didn't really help too much to point this out. But, um, uh, you know, this is just a truth. If I feel myself upset, it doesn't do any good for me to try to figure out what's wrong with the other person. I need to figure out what's wrong with me. Why am I upset? Why does something cause this emotion in me? It's very easy just to say the person caused this emotion. But it says something about me. There must be something inside of me that needs to be addressed. Not something in that other person. No, it may be true. There might be something in that other person that needs to be addressed, but I have no ability to change that other person or to address whatever it was. But I can address what it is inside of me that causes me to feel the way that I do. So the spirit of Christ made them one. It's the spirit of Satan that brings this dissension and envy and jealousy. Um, so Jones has said he's going to read this passage that he's read a time or two. Jesus longs to bestow the heavenly endowment in large measure upon his people. How great and widespread must be the power of the prince of evil, which can be subdued only by the mighty power of the spirit. Disloyalty to God, transgression in every form, has spread over our world. Those who would preserve their allegiance to God, who are active in his servants, service, become the mark of every shaft and weapon of hell. So we can see, I mean, this is uh, it's a pretty powerful quote, but we can see that when you're following the truth, Satan has his weapons aimed at you. That brings us right to the lessons we have had the previous evenings, that we cannot stand at all if we have not Christ. 
If those who have had great light have not corresponding faith and obedience, they soon become leavened with the prevailing apostasy. Right? Those who have had great light but have not had corresponding faith and obedience. So who is that? Have we had great light? Do we um, have a course of faith and obedience? We've had great light. Yeah. So if we don't have corresponding faith and obedience, we will become leavened with the prevailing apostasy. Another spirit controls them. While they have been exalted to heaven in point of opportunities and privileges, they are in a worse condition than the most zealous advocates of error we've had these great light and privileges adventism has we have in this movement we have greater light than the adventist church has we have a greater responsibility and if we do not obey if we don't have a corresponding faith we are going to be agents of satan and also in a worse condition because we will not be able to see, no light will be able to penetrate to cause us to repent of our sins. Those who have had great light, if they have not corresponding faith and obedience, are in a worse condition than most zealous advocates of error. John says, that is you and I. Judgment begins at the house of God. When those messengers went through the city to smite and slay utterly, he was counseled to begin at the ancient men before the house, and if we are in a worse position than the most zealous advocates of error, then the judgment must begin with us. There are many who have thus been preparing themselves for moral inefficiency in the great crisis. We will stop right here in this, with this lesson and take this up in the next lesson, which we already studied, uh, number nine. So um, we're going to go to number 10 here. So we, we did them in the wrong order, but that's okay. Um, still here. And one of the things uh, I just wanted to point out, um, when we were studying number nine, there was this, this reference to uh, pages 186 and 187 of the Testimonies, volume one. All right, so I just want to, um, that was at the end of when we studied uh, his ninth presentation. And, and this actually started on page 185 of the General Conference Bulletin. So if you go back, um, I think it's on the next page. Yeah, so this is page 185, uh, beginning, I believe. Don't know if it's the end of 185. But, you know, 186 and 187, those are references to uh, the cardinal and the ordinal count from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. So I just thought I'd bring that to your attention. I thought it was kind of interesting. So yeah. <clears throat> didn't we go over that when, when you presented that the first? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did present it. I did mention yeah, it. Just wanted it was to... interesting. Yeah. And, and, it, and I wasn't sure which page and I, I still need to go to the general conference bulletin itself and just see exactly because sometimes when people, whoever put this together, I, I think it was probably uh, uh, Pat Temple who put this together. Um, but it could have been someone else. But sometimes they just put the, the page number, which is at the bottom of the page. It's just so it's possible that it was actually on page 186 that he refers to page 186 and 187 of the first volume of the testimony. So. I need to, I need to look that up. Um, so you understand what I'm saying. So it depends whether the the document they were copying from had the pagination at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Page, the top of the page. Yeah, because right? he was just copying it and putting it on a on a document, and those numbers sometimes transfer. Yeah, yeah. So if it, yeah, so that's that could be what what happened. So I don't know when. Uh, Patricia Temple, I think it would have been that this document. Um, possible. It could have been someone else. But anyway. You can go into the properties and usually find out who the original um, creator was. 
Yeah, you sometimes can. Sometimes, not always. Yeah, I just want to see. I'm just looking at this now. Uh, not a whole lot of info in there. No, um, created on January 18, 2012. Um, modified April 9th, 2013. There's an Apple computer that it was converted to a PDF. So it's just telling us about the PDF itself. Right. Um, so it doesn't. Um... I know when you get a document from me, if it's a Word document, it usually has the creation time, my name, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Number 10. So Jones is going to go more into uh, the Laodicean message, and, and we dealt with that in chapter nine and chapter eight, right? So these are, you know, Jones said eight and nine were going to be the most difficult, uh, or was it nine and 10? Yeah, nine and 10 are going to be the most difficult presentations. That would be eight and nine, the next two. But I think this one would be included in there. Um, so I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy, thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, we're very familiar with the Laodicean message, being Laodiceans ourselves, and having all of this counsel in the spirit of prophecy. Now, uh, we know how Jeff takes this message, and he had tied it to the Time Prophets presentation. So I'm sure many of you have, have heard Jeff present that, and maybe even have seen the original presentation on Time Prophets. Right? And so... We know that um, uh, the the remedy or the cure, this gold tried in the fire, gold, um, white raiment, Ellen White, and eye salve, right? The eye salve being uh, because Ellen means a bright and shining light so that we can see, right? We're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So, so we know that the spirit of prophecy is the message to the Laodicean church, correct? It's the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Correct. Correct. Because it's Christ speaking to us. Yes. Right. Or the other guy. Well, I'm just saying. That, <laughs> I yeah, understand. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. didn't want to do that. Yeah, I but Christ that. is speaking to us. Many people misuse the spirit of prophecy. Right? They take it out of its context. That's they right. It, and they use them against other people. Right? They never apply it to themselves. So, so people can do that. But this is God's love to us. Many, as many as I love, I rebuke you. Can chase them. Now, I remember some uh, years ago uh, when I first became uh, an Adventist, you know, early on, and I rejoiced in the spirit of prophecy. But there would be people, sometimes people who had been Adventists for a long time, sometimes not, uh, who didn't like the spirit of prophecy. Um, they thought Ellen White was too critical. And, and all I ever saw in the spirit of prophecy was love. I didn't see a critical spirit in Ellen, Ellen White in any way. So, um, but I know that people see that. Now, part of it is how Ellen White has been used by others. Because critical people will take spirit of prophecy statements and use them against other people to put them down, to make them feel little to make themselves feel superior in some way. And there can be all little kinds of things that Ellen White says that people focus upon. Different things about diet, different things about dress, 
these things that are outward that we can use, that we can easily conform to if we want to, but we ignore the weightier matters of the law, you know, mercy and love, kindness, the fruits of the spirit. Those things are not often manifested in those who profess to believe in the spirit of prophecy or the Bible in general, right? And, and this, of course, the message to the Laodiceans, we always think is about some other person, never a message about us. And, and this is this number 10 uh, is the one that I remember the most of the articles that I read from the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. I think the last time I read uh, these articles would have been um, maybe 25 years ago. So it's been a while. Um, I've read the, the 1895 General Conference Bulletin more recently. Um, but this one I've actually read a few times on my own. So this was one of the uh, the chapters or the messages from this uh, General Conference that, that I found that struck me the most way back then. Uh, this is the council we want to study tonight. I counsel thee. Who is this? The congregation Christ. And what is he called in, in the 14th verse? Faithful and true witness. He will make quite a good counselor, will he? The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, comes and counsels you and me. Isn't that a good deal of condescension, considering the place from whence the counselor comes? That which we have been studying during the several lessons that are past, that which has come before us so constantly, and so fully a few days past now, that word sent to the Laodicean church as to what we are and how we do not know it, that has come to us from every point of the compass, hasn't it, the last few days? It has come from every side and from every mouth that is spoken. And the Lord, with all the rest, has spoken direct to us in the word that was read yesterday upon that very thing. Well, I suppose that now, that all now are ready to confess that what he says is so. So I will not repeat any of that tonight. He has told us that. And now if we confess that that is so, we shall be ready to take his counsel and appreciate it and will profit by his counsel because it is only those persons whom he, whom he counsels, those who receive his testimony, those who are spoken of just before this, he counsels those who are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked, and do not know it. Those that are lukewarm, that is the people to whom this counsel is given. Well, having been brought to that place by the word and testimony, and in every way, the Lord has dealt with us these days that are past. In all the lessons that have been given us, then he stoops down and counsels us. Isn't that so? Then, brethren, let us not be so slow to take this counsel as we were the other. Let us not be so slow to come to a place where we can adopt this as we were to get into a place where we could adopt the other. Well, then, he comes as a counselor from this time henceforth. Isn't that so? So the congregation says, yes. Then when you want to know whether you shall sell out your property, I suppose you will go ask your brother what to do? The congregation says, ask the counselor. When you want to know what to do, you are going to ask some other man what to do, are you? Why then, I want to know what to do. When I want to know what to do. How is any man to tell me when, if he were in my place, he would have to ask the same question as to what he would do? How am I going to get any help from him when he himself does not know what he would do unless he were in the place where I am? And even then, he would have to ask counsel for himself. Now, this brings up a point um, about the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White is, in a sense, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, right? So God is speaking through. Ellen White, Christ is speaking through Ellen White to us who are Laodiceans, correct? Correct. Agreed. 
Now, when it comes to the counsel that Ellen White gives, especially when it's personal counsel, you can see that Ellen White provides a counsel that points us to Christ. Agreed? Yes, she does. Right? She points us to Christ as the answer. She doesn't provide herself as the answer. She doesn't come with her opinions and ideas about what some individual should do. She points them to Christ, even when she is giving them counsel, sometimes very direct counsel that meets their situation. She doesn't want them to depend upon her, but upon Christ. And many times people would come to her asking for direct counsel. And she says she would point them to Christ because Christ could give them the answer that they seek. Often her counsel is rebukes, especially when it comes to the church and the leadership. And, and especially when the church, obviously the church, it needs the counsel of the spirit of prophecy regarding organization, how we should run our schools, how we should operate our churches. These aren't really personal issues, right? This is something counsel that's to the entire church. But even then, she still points the church to Christ. She did, just didn't put herself in the place of Christ and just become this mediator between us and Christ. She didn't become a pope, did she? No. no. And, and we see this all through the spirit of prophecy. And, and, and so when it comes to this question about Ellen White being critical, I don't see it. I see somebody who cares about us, who points us to Christ, who presents from the scriptures, the words of Christ, and gives the counsel of Christ, but asks us to take up that counsel to obey. Right? She's not there as the authority. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a cult of Ellen White. Ellen White never puts herself in that place. Correct? Well, I've never seen it. I've Neither never seen it. <clears throat> and so much so, when the church decides to send her to Australia, she goes to Australia, Right. Yes, she did. And she knew exactly why they sent her. Yeah. So that's not somebody who's the head, a, a cult leader in a church. Right? right? That's right. So she had to manifest the spirit of Christ because she's the, she is giving that straight testimony. <clears throat> Perhaps this is the way I would do it. I'm only a common member of the church and I must go to the elder of the church or someone of the more, more prominence and ask him what to do. But suppose he wants to know for himself. I suppose he must ask the president of the conference what to do. Elder Boyd says, isn't there safety in the multitude of counselors? And I was thinking the same thing. And, and Jones is going to address that, of course. But the, suppose the president of the conference wanted to know and needed to ask then he would have to ask the president of the general conference, I suppose. Um, but suppose the president of the general conference wants to know, who shall he ask? The congregation says, ask the Lord. Oh, well, you can ask the Lord, can you? So then we common people can get our knowledge from the Lord without straining it through half a dozen persons like the other Catholics, can we? Congregation, yes. Is that so? Like the other Catholics? Is that what he said? Yeah. Um, in the Catholic Church, the common people cannot get at the Lord except through the priest and the priest through the bishop and the bishop through the archbishop and the archbishop through the cardinal and the cardinal through the pope. Is that the way the Lord's people are to do? No, sir. That isn't God's method. When you want to know a thing, you ask the Lord. He is your counselor, and he is my counselor. And when he is your counselor, then, Brother Boyd, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And not until then, either, 
because then we have counsel of the master of assemblies. And when he is the counselor of each one, and then we counsel together, and he is in the midst, then there is safety in the multitude of counselors. Now, of course, what does the church do with this idea of a multitude of counselors? Somebody comes along with something that, like the 2520, we have some insight into Adventist history. And what do they tell us to do? Shut them up. Well, no, they say you have to send it to who? Who do you send your, your paper to, to get approval, to get the imprimatur of, of the church? You the have biblical to biblical research to council. Yeah, so the B Biblical Research Institute, the BRI, right? You send it to them, and, and then they will decide whether it's truth. Now, it's kind of interesting. Uh, back in the 1970s, I think it was like 1971, I found a document that was uh, put together by the General Conference, and it was, it was entitled something like How to, How to Address New Light. And... The, the guidelines that were set up then, that I don't think it ever got voted through at the general conference. But, and, and I'm not sure, you know, what happened to the document where, where it passed, but it probably never got brought to the general conference itself, but I don't know. But anyway, in de dealing with new light, um, they didn't recommend that you send it to the BRI. Because one is they saw that light could come from anywhere in the church, that even the lowliest saint could have light that the church might need. So they didn't have the idea in 1970 or 71 that somehow all, all of the light needs to come from our scholars, right? That there is such a thing as new light that can come to this church and that it needs to be examined. And, and what they had suggested was that that church member needs to go to its local church and there the pastor and the elders study out whatever issue it is that this person has has brought has has come to understand and if, if they decide that there's some light in it then they would bring this information uh, to the local conference and it would be studied out again and if they continue, can continue to see light in it, then eventually it would be brought up to the general conference. Now, we, we can see that that's not how the church has dealt with this. Because has the church really wanted to study out any new light that ever comes from its members? If they're telling us that we need to just send it to the BRI. No, they're not wanting to study it. Right. So, so this, in my view, this is a way to deal with new light, that the people who know that person need to study with them, right? Me sending some paper off to the BRI, I mean, makes no sense. They don't know who I am, right? They'll just see it's something they don't agree with, and they'll just ignore it, right? Well, that's what happens when you use... Um systems like that yeah. now this is a little bit different than asking for counsel but you yeah. we got to keep your mic off you birds too loud so anyway um so when we're when we're looking at counselors this is a different situation but there is a role for the structure because this structure of of having churches and conferences and unions and general conference this is something that was set up by god but it's supposed to be a bottom-up structure is it not not a top-down structure yes right because if each member is connected to christ he's a he's a member of that council of the master of assemblies is he not every church member has as much connection with christ as any other church member, at least that's the yeah, that's what um, Jones is telling us, yeah. and I guess the spirit of prophecy approved it. Yes, and 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 so we know that, that when it comes to uh, counsel, there is 
there is wisdom in in the multitude of counselors. That is, if I know that something or believe something to be true, and I counsel together with my brethren, I study things out, and 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 I pray together with them, because I'm not looking to that person to just make a decision for me so that I don't have to bear the responsibility of some decision. You seek out those who also have a connection with Christ. And so there is safety. I have to be careful that I'm not just deluding myself. But the church doesn't have any mechanism for this to occur when it comes to new light. Right? If you if you found something in God's word, you have to go to the top so to speak. And and that's not how God's church works. So we believe in the priesthood of all believers. I remember um, shortly after I moved to Warburg, we had a, a pastor named, uh, well, Pastor Friesen, whatever his first name was, I can't think of it. But um, Pastor Friesen did a sermon one time that made it clear that we believe as Adventists in the priesthood of all believers that no church officer, no matter how high their office, has any authority beyond any individual member. That, that we are all priests of God. You wouldn't hear that in the church today. The church was quite different 40 years ago than it is today but we have been been in the church for a lot of years we act very much as the church that we criticize <clears throat> so jones goes on he says you will find a sentence in gospel workers like this we are to counsel together and to be subject one to another but at the same time we are to exercise the ability God has given us in order to learn what is truth. Each one of us must look to God for divine enlightenment. After you have received counsel from the wise, the, the judicious, there is yet a counselor whose wisdom is, is unerring. Fail not to present your case before him and entreat his directions. He has promised that if you lack wisdom and ask of him, he will give it to you liberally and upbraid not. Then I ask again from this night henceforth, is he your counselor? Is he individually your counselor? counselor? The congregation says yes. And the word that we heard from Brother Underwood on the same subject, especially in the selling of property, if there were more of this seeking the Lord for his guidance, there would be more of his direction. We would have more of him in our work and in our counsels. What in the world did he make himself our counselor for? If he did not expect we should have his counsel, then let us have it. What is his name? Congregation says, wonderful counselor. The way it is printed is, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. That is the name whereby he shall be called. What is the first part of his name? Congregation, wonderful the second part, congregation counselor. Then we have mighty God and everlasting father. And then last of all, prince of peace. He is wonderful and counselor. Then isn't he a wonderful counselor? And I should say so. You will also remember that other passage, wonderful in counsel. And what else? Excellent in working. Don't forget that when he comes as a counselor. He is there as a worker too. And the counsel which he gives us gives is as a worker and as an excellent worker who will perform the work for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So now we have this counselor, the faithful and true witness, the wonderful counselor, wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Then when we have sought this counsel and obtained it, he is to go right with us in the execution of the counsel as well as be there to give it at first. Isn't that so? If we have not learned that, there's no use for us to go any further at all unless we do depend fully upon his power, his character, his righteousness, and his life. 
Because if there be any other consideration and any other way which we are to take, we might just as well give up right now and stop. That being so, we could not go any further without him. Very good then. He is the wonderful counselor, wonderful in counsel, and excellent in working. And he says, I am with you to counsel. I am with you to execute. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Other scriptures besides this passage show that nothing will satisfy us but that gold which will stand the test of the fire. You remember uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 4 to 5, speaking of the living hope unto which God has begotten us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and how we are kept by the power of God. Through faith unto salvation. How are we kept? The congregation by the power of God. Through what? Congregation faith. Unto what? Congregation salvation. When? Congregation ready to be revealed at the last time. We might now read ready to be revealed and could stop right there. And it would be so for we have come to the last time. But this hope, how are we kept? Congregation by the power of God. Through what? Congregation through faith. Where ye do what? Greatly rejoice. Do you now? I want to know now, is that so? The congregation says, yes, yes. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, do you? Then why do you go moping around with your face drawn down? The time has come for us to believe the scriptures. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The Lord said it and he greatly rejoiced that it was so. Is that so tonight? That we greatly rejoice. The congregation says yes. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, we are in heaviness through manifold temptations. What is manifold? Congregation, manifold. We are in manifold temptations and greatly rejoice all that time. How can that be? It can be because God says so, and it is so, is it? That is the only way I know it can be, because he says it is so. Now, what is this for? That the trial of your faith be much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. What is tried? Congregation, faith. Are you to expect your faith to be tried as with fire? Are you expecting your faith to endure the test as gold passing through the fire? Congregation says yes. We will study this further. What care men take in this world of the gold that perisheth? Many hoard a great deal of gold, and great buildings are erected, safe deposits. Then they have a little box and a lock, and they put it in a bigger box and lock that, and put it in a great safe with lots of boxes, and that is locked again. And then a great steel gate shuts up the whole thing, and that is locked. And a guard walks around it all night to see that it is safe. Hundreds of people in these large cities are thus carrying for their gold that perisheth. Let me say to you, my brethren and sisters, the trial of your faith, I care not how weak it may be, is more precious in the sight of our wonderful counselor, is more precious in the sight of God than all the gold and jewels in all the safe deposit vaults that are on earth. Do not be afraid that he is going to forget it. What does he call it? More precious than gold that perisheth. Who is it that says that? The wonderful counselor, the Lord himself. Let us then thank him that he regards our weak, trembling faith like that. Well then, brethren, haven't we right there one of the greatest possible encouragements that the Lord can offer? Why people bewail their weak faith, I do not know. Sometimes you say, I haven't any faith. Well, the Lord says you have, and I say, thank him for what you have. I do not care how little you have, it would be like a mustard seed. Thank him that you have it and thank him that it is more precious to him than all the gold and wealth of this earth. That is the way the Lord regards your faith. You are not to question whether you have faith or not. God says you have it and it is so. Let us read Romans 10 verse 6 to 8. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? 
The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Then it is right to bewail and wonder whether we have faith or not? Not so. God has planted faith in every heart that is born into this world. By that light which lighteth every man which cometh into the world, God will cause that faith to grow exceedingly, and he will reveal his righteousness unto us as it grows from faith to faith. And where does faith, faith come from anyway? God gave it to us. And who is the author of faith? Christ. And that light which lighteth every man which cometh into the world is Jesus Christ. This is the faith that is in every man's heart. If each one uses the faith which he has, he will never have any lack of faith. But if he will not use the faith that he has, how in the world is he going to get any more? Now, before we go on here, so Jones is focusing upon this message to the Laodiceans, and he's looking at this cure to buy gold tried in the fire. He counsels us to do this. So in a very practical sense, and he's going to go through this, um, what is this gold tried in the fire? We, we know it's faith, but what is it? Faith under exper uh, uh, um, experience. Okay, so it's it's experience, right? It's it's a faith that has been tried. Um, you know, I remember um, reading uh, well, my aunt who lived with us, Aunt Joy. Uh, she had uh, these two little books. One was called uh, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. They're poems by uh, William Blake. And um, um, and I studied them in university as well. I even wrote uh, a song to one of the poems, uh, The Clod and the Pebble. And um, so these, these, the idea that Blake had, Blake was kind of an odd fellow, William Blake, but um, the idea that he had is that there is innocence and there's experience. And so innocence is the faith of a child, right? So we need the faith of the child, do we not? Yes. We need to trust our father. We need to um, rest in that trust to know that he loves us and he cares for us. But do we also need a faith that is tried, a faith of experience? A childlike faith is good for a child. It's something that's important to help us to first come to God, right? Right. We don't have any experience. A child doesn't have experience, but he needs to trust. And children do have trust in their parents. They trust in people that even are untrustworthy, parents that are untrustworthy, right? But we need that faith of a child in order to approach God because we don't have experience. But if we just, can we continue just with the faith of a child without experience? Doesn't appear that way. No, we need to have a faith that's tried, a, a faith of experience as well. And, and that faith is even a greater faith, right? The faith of a child is necessary. That's the faith in which we approach God in the first place. But the faith of experience is the thing that's necessary to bring us through the greatest trials. Right? So both of these faiths are needed. We need innocence, the faith of innocence, and the faith of experience. So, so the fire, when you're working with gold, um, the fire creates the heat, the um that's the trial the, that's the trial but the heat is off is is actually uh what separates the dross out yeah, well, of the, yeah so the gold has to melt and that's then right the so the dross can be separated out. and that's so that's right so when we first come to god we come to him as a child when i first come to god we came to god 
you know, I was a child still, but I didn't, I didn't know what needed to change. Right. There's all kinds of things in my character that I had no knowledge of, but I could trust God and I could go through experiences then and trust that God was doing the right thing. But as I went through those experiences, I came to see things about myself that he couldn't have shown me when I was just a child. He couldn't have shown me what sacrifices I would have to go through, what trials I would have to face, what things I would have to lose, what decisions I would have to make. Right. So those are the, costs, are the things that. I yes, Jeff. It's like how you dealt with the disciples. Mm -hmm. So then we have faith, have we not? And the trial of your faith is more precious than all the gold that was ever on this earth. And mark you, it is more precious in the sight of God. Not that gold is precious in the sight. Not that that is not the thought at all. It is more precious in the sight of God than all the gold that would be in the sight of, of, of a man. How precious would all the gold be if man had it all? Would you not think himself rich? Would not he pride himself upon it wonderfully? Then do not forget that the trial of your faith, which you have, no matter how small it may be, is more precious in the sight of God than all the gold of this world would be in the sight of a man. So then the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold, which perisheth, though it be tried with, a fi with fire, is precious in the sight of God. Who is the most interested in that? Pro who is the most interested in that process? Congregation, the Lord, assuredly. For I cannot express how precious it is in His sight. My idea of how precious it is in His sight is just as far from the reality of it as my thoughts are from His thoughts. Consequently, He is the most interested person in all the universe in the trial of our faith, in the working of our faith, and in the process of it. Isn't it a gift from Him? Isn't it to his interest? This is this is the true light in which we should view this matter. Now, to add to that, so when we think about our trials, how difficult they are, how painful sorrow can be, and, and we see in those trials, we see our need of God and we call out to him. We ask for his help. We look at ourselves and we see our insufficiencies. This is the thing that is precious because we are precious to God. Without these things, can God bring us into his kingdom? Can he give us the gifts that he wants to give us? No. No, he can't. So because we are precious... The trial of our faith is precious in his sight. Then we read further. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love. Do we not? He says we do, and it is so. In whom... Though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Is not that so? Assuredly it is. But brethren, I often think of that verse, whom having not seen, ye love. And believing it is so, I wonder what in the world it would, will be when we see him. And the blessedness of it is, we will not have to wait long for that now. Congregation. Praise the Lord. There is another passage I will refer to found in the 12th verse of the fourth chapter of 1 Peter. Beloved, who? Beloved. Is that so? Why, brethren, how can we be anything else than the gladdest people on the earth when God talks to us like that? He comes and makes himself the wonderful counselor and wants to counsel and talk with us. And the first word he says is beloved. Now we have thought many a time that when the angel came to David directly and said, "O man, greatly beloved," uh, that he was quite a person. That it was quite that that was quite a personal statement. It can be no more personal than this is to you and me. He comes himself and says, "Beloved." Then, 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. The word to us now, brethren, is beloved. Let us use the word in that way. Beloved, we are to treat the fiery trials as strangers henceforth. There is nothing strange about it. Then it will not surprise us when we meet them. You know, a great many people are suddenly um, uh, are, are somewhat diffident and bashful. And when they meet a stranger suddenly face to face, they are quite out of countenance. Now, if you and I are going to be diffident and bashful about the trials, we're going to come face to face with some of them one of these days, a brawny one. And then if we are diffident and bashful at all, we will put, be put out of confidence or out of countenance. But just as certainly as anybody is put out of countenance by a trial, just so certainly the enemy has got the victory there. That is the way he wants to catch us off our guard so that we will be startled and put out of countenance for even a moment and he will get in his fiery darts and wound us. So, I mean, Jones here is using a little bit different expression than we would, but the idea is that when a trial comes to us, we shouldn't really be surprised. And we shouldn't look at a trial as something negative, that God has a purpose in that trial, that there's something he needs to show us, something he needs to do to correct us. The Lord comes and counsels us like this. Think it not strange. So then, when we meet these fiery trials, we are not going to meet a stranger. Do you see? We will be acquainted. We will know them. I do not care how bashful or diffident a person is. When he meets an acquaintance, he is not astonished at any sudden meeting. He will not be put out of countenance, but he is glad to meet his acquaintance. Then the Lord wants us to be so well acquainted with fiery trials, that no matter how suddenly we meet them, we can say, all right, glad to meet you, sir. I know you come along. I know you come along. Then when he tells us this, let us not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, as though some strange thing happened unto us. We are not to meet them and deal with them as strangers, but as acquaintances. Not only that, but we are to meet them as helpers on to Zion. Now, we can only have that type of experience is if we uh, is that type of faith which comes from experience because when we first become christians are we expecting trials are we ready for trials no we're not no and and often we get caught off our guard we first become christians and especially if we became Christians in a church where it tells us that once we become a Christian, everything's going to be easy, easy uh, going, right? Many people have this idea. Now that I become a Christian, everything's going to be fine. Everything's and, smooth and lovely. And then we want to share what would, this light that's come to us. And, and we go to the people that we love and we know. And we start sharing this, and we expect that they're going to accept it, right? This wonderful thing that's changed our lives. And we share it, and what happens? For the most part, they're not ready to accept it, are they? We learn these things, these wonderful things, and when somebody opposes us, we get caught off our guard. We go through this trial. Now, God does warn us of these trials, but, but we don't have any experience with them. We don't know what they're like and how they're going to come about. But now we know because we have experience. So we know when we have some truth that's, that God has shown us and we present it to someone else, that likely they're not going to receive it, right? Right. We know that when we follow God, we're going to be gossiped about. We know we're going to be, our characters are going to be maligned. Should that surprise us? No. No, it shouldn't surprise us. These fiery trials, yeah, these fiery trials should not surprise us. But we also have to recognize that these trials are there for our benefit. 
that God is trying to teach us something. It's it's like somebody telling you, telling you they say, um, if you know if there's a God, why is there all this death and mayhem going around? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of you know. That's what I was thinking anyway. Mm -hmm. James told us long ago, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. What did he call us there? My brethren. He calls us my brethren here and other places we are called beloved. What does diverse mean? Different. What does Paul, what does Peter call it? Manifold. Then my brethren, count it all joy when we all, when we fall, I think it should be, fall into diverse, different, and various kinds of temptations. So we see by these different definitions that the thought that the thought is counted all joy when we fall into all kinds of temptations. And when and we will count none of them strange, because we are to regard them all as acquaintances. We read further, but rejoice in as much as ye shall be partakers. Oh no, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That is the point. In James, he says, my brethren. Now let us read a text that will connect both of them. Hebrews 2, verse 10 to 12. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory, unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that are sanctified Sancti he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Of course, we know this is Hebrews chapter 2, where Paul is showing that Jesus is fully man, right? So he took upon himself our nature. He became our brethren, even though he's our God. This is why he calls us brethren and why we are to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. For he has been there. He has met every one of them. He has met each temptation to its fullest extent. He has passed through all these things for us. And then he comes back and says to us, I will pass through them with you. He passed through them alone for us first. And now he passes through them with us. I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with me. But thank the Lord, God was with him. For the Father hath not left me alone. Thank the Lord that he had the royal courage to do it alone, trusting only the Father to be with him. And oh, how good he is not to ask us to try it alone. No, he comes and says, I will go through, go with you through all these trials. My brethren, he will go with you. So then this is why we are not to, why we are not to count them strange. He calls us his brethren, and he has passed through every one of these trials and is acquainted with them, and therefore we are not to count them strangers. Now, um, I just want to look at a few verses here, just that Jones is kind of referring to. Um, these are in the book of Isaiah. Um, so, uh, the first one I have here, this is uh, Isaiah 59. It says, and he saw there was no man and wondered that there was no, no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness. It sustained him. Now, what is this talking about? Who saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor? Well, if we read the verses before, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Is that in this world today? Yea, truth faileth, yes. and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. 
So in this case here, there is no man as an intercessor for us, right? So his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So who's the him? Okay, let's look at uh, the Isaac. soldier. Okay. The so soldier or the, the individual. Okay, so the, yeah, so the individual, okay. Um, this is another one. It says, wherefore, when I came, there was no man. When I called, there was none to answer. Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke, I dry up the sea and I make rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh because there is no water and dieth for first thirst. So who is this that saw that there was no man? That well, it sounds he was the one that dried up the rivers, right? That sounds like yeah. God, right? Okay. Um, so Isaiah sixty three. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my is fear that, is that Christ? Christ? This is Christ, right? So, so in our trials, Christ saw that there was no one to save us. So he has come to save us and experience these trials for us. Can we see that? Well, I can now. Okay. So when he brought salvation unto him, that would be unto us. But he also had to first do this for himself. His own arm brought salvation unto him himself, right? Unto me. His own fury, his anger, it upheld him. His anger against sin. Because Christ loved us, he hates sin. Correct? Correct. And, and those people that are going to cling to their sins, that will not be saved, he will tread those them down in his anger, right? Not because he hates them, but because he loves them, right? Because he loves us. There's a lot in this. So anyway, our time is up, but um, we'll, we'll come to this then on Friday again. We'll continue reading um, Jones. Maybe I'll put this together a little bit here about these verses. Uh, but that's what Jones quoted part of this verse, uh, that he trod the wine press alone. He experienced this alone. But he did it for our sake. Okay. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath, for the things that we could study, for your Holy Spirit's presence, and for the words of your messenger uh, from 1893 that speak to us today, that come from your word. And um, we ask, Lord, that we can continue uh, to experience uh, your work in our lives, that we can have a faith that is tried, that is precious. Be with each one. May your angels watch over us and may you guide us with your eye. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.